Have you heard? Metro by T-Mobile now includes Amazon Prime. Yes, enjoy the best of shopping and entertainment, movies, TV shows, music, free shipping, and much more. All included for just $40 per line for three lines. All on the T-Mobile network. Discover the smarter way. Metro by T-Mobile. That's genius. One offer per account. Offer subject to change. $12.99 per month value. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Metro customers may notice reduced speeds versus some T-Mobile customers. Video at 480p. Capable device required. See store for details and terms and conditions. This is New York firefighter Raphael Poirier for Firehouse Subs. Every day, a part of every sub you buy at Firehouse Subs helps provide life-saving equipment for first responders. And now, for a limited time, they're introducing the Daily Sub Special. Every day, get a medium sub of the day for just $5.55. They kick it off with Meatball Monday and finish it off with Italian Sunday with something delicious every day in between for just $5.55. Firehouse Subs. Enjoy more subs. Save more lives. Tap the banner now to learn more. Hello, hi, everybody. This is uh, Janet Kira Lesson with Aquarian Radio and AquarianRadio.com. And I'm here with my host, Karen Christine Patrick. This is an episode of Experiencers Network, a part of the Aquarian Radio Network. And today we have an Experiencer Secret Space Program personnel, <laughs> and his name is Kevin Trimble, and we just met. I'm very excited to bring him to this show. Before I bring on Kevin, I'd like to bring on Karen Patrick. Karen, say aloha to everybody. Aloha to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So, uh, Karen, where where are you uh, located? Just tell our listeners where you're. Oh, yeah, I'm located in beautiful, sunny Silver City, New Mexico, kind of in the southwest corner. And uh, we've just had the most amazing uh, January. It's been between 60 and 70 degrees pretty much the whole month. And I'm just amazed and stunned, and I really like it. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm in Maui, Hawaii, and it's been sunny and beautiful. But we're getting a, uh, what do you, they call it, a southerly wind, and it makes everything gust, and uh, all the branches are falling off trees and hitting the house. So it's kind of exciting. Ooh! <laughs> but it's not really a storm. It's just the wind flow. It's, and it gusts, tends to be perfectly still, and all of a sudden it picks up and goes, and then everything goes, and falls on the house, and then it stops again. So it's very exciting. All right, and then Kevin Trimble, where do you hail from? Where are you calling in from? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm from uh, Ontario, Canada, and uh, right now I'm living in London. But um, I grew up in Cambridge, Ontario, and that's uh, that's when I get into my story. That's where it all began for me, uh, Cambridge, Ontario, which is about an hour away from London. So, oh, okay, wonderful. Oh, well, uh, we'll just start at the beginning since we don't know very much about you. Uh, you sent a bio, but I can't see it on this uh, system Zoom. So we'll just have you tell our listeners who you are and uh, start your story. And we'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes. And then Karen and I are going to um, ask you questions periodically. We'll interrupt. We'll try to do it uh, politely. And because, uh, you know, there's a lot of ground we want to cover here. And, and we're all going to go, ooh, ooh, because this is very exciting information that you bring to the table. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Take it away. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for having me on, and um, I'll just jump right in here. Uh, back in 2008, November of 2008, uh, in Cambridge, Ontario, uh, I was bicycling uh, in the Blair Forest, and um, I uh, took a break, and I uh, was drinking some water, and just there on the trail with my mountain bike, and um, it was a sun and cloud day, and uh, this... Uh, the sky just went black. So I just thought it was like a cloud overhead that had blocked out the sun. So I look up and this um, white <laughs> triangle, uh, TR3, uh, was flying right above me. Uh, it was hovering just above the treetop, so like less than 500 feet off the ground. I could um, actually make up the paneling on it. So it wasn't one piece. You could actually see the paneling on it. And it was a perfect white triangle. And uh, it was relatively silent. It made um, a, a, a very faint uh, humming sound, but very, very faint. And um, so I looked up at this thing, um, expecting to see a cloud. And, you know, I, I saw what I just described. And um, it started moving, but it was moving at uh, a walking pace. Um, so I actually started, 
uh, walking my mountain bike along the trail and I was able to keep up with it. That's how slow it was moving. And um, so I walked underneath this thing for uh, five minutes until uh, the trail opened up into a field. And right when I got to the field, um, it started to um, go like up straight up into the air. And um, so I'm watching it go up and then I got hit with this wave of nausea and like, like, like vertigo, like could, couldn't even stand. I had to sit down uh, in the field and put my uh, head between my knees because I thought I was going to throw up. And um, I later found out that that's actually when they um, picked me up and put me back originally. Oh. Uh, so, yeah. So what happened was um, um, this year um, I uh, had a higher self channeling session with Carl Mollison and um, I asked him about that event. And um, with, uh, now he channels your higher self. So it's actually like my future self that is channeling coming, mm-hmm. you know, coming back into time to let me know what happened. And uh, so I asked him about that event and he said that like initially when I looked up and I was just flying about the treetops, that was, um, that was like a greeting. And that's why they uh, allowed me to walk underneath it for five minutes. And then um, when I uh, got to the field, um, yeah, that's when they actually picked me up and put me back. And um, I got hit with the, with the, the dizziness and sickness um, when they actually like beam you up and then beam you back. Um, so, so they didn't yeah, keep you so. for a while. They just went boom, boom. Oh no, they did. They did. Okay. Um, but they, uh, they mind wipe you. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this is where like the recalls come right. back. Uh, initially when it happened, um, I thought it was exactly what you just described. Like I thought, um, actually I didn't even think they had picked me up. I just thought I had witnessed a UFO. Um, mm-hmm. but it, like I knew it was man-made because it was, um, you know, you could see the paneling on it. Um, I knew it was a, like a, uh, like a top secret type of military craft that I had witnessed, but still uh, an unidentified flying object, so a UFO. Right. So I thought I had just seen this thing. It was just a sighting, and um, I couldn't understand uh, why um, I suddenly got hit with this nausea um, when I uh, hit the field. And um, uh, But what happened was um, a couple of weeks later, um, like into December, I started having the recalls, which um, – it's basically nightmares, night terrors, um, but like very vivid dreaming, but uh, I'm lucid. So I'm aware that I'm dreaming. Uh, and uh, what's freaky about that is um, those are the memories. So all right. this stuff started coming back to me. Um, but from my um, original perspective, before the blank slating um, started to break down, um, I just thought it was a UFO sighting. Let me ask you a question. Um is there a difference between a TR3B and a TR3? You said TR3. I call yeah, I call the TR3 now because I guess the TR3B um they're onto like uh, the G series now. They're yeah. onto um they made quite a like uh, the one I'm referring to um it's still an older one. Um I wouldn't say it's a TR3B, it's a TR3. Um, I've, I've done quite a bit of research into this topic trying to figure out what happened to me and uh what I was able to put together was it was the Navy faction that had abducted me, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, in Canada and uh, the UK, uh, we tend to have um, a scaled down version of the Black Triangle. Uh, most people are familiar with the Black TR3, uh-huh. um, and those ones are quite quite large. Um, this is a scaled down version of that, and it's white, and it's used in Canada um, for something called the Aurora Space Fleet that patrols the Arctic, and. Um, and also um, the UK uses a, a white one as well, and Australia, and um, uh, basically the British Commonwealth uh, uses the scaled down version. And then the uh, US has the, the uh, you know, the black triangle, which is um, quite advanced and quite large, actually. Right. That's the Phoenix triangle, the real, the real large one. Or is that a different uh, yeah. style? Or is that a uh, well, I, I think they have quite a they have a couple of different models, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, the black triangles tend to be the U.S. Uh, they and they're always mu- they seem to be much larger. And yeah, have different models. Um, the one I'm referring to, um, it was built back in the '80s, and it okay. is, uh, it's it's built it's still in service. It's still being used uh, by Canada, um, but uh, it, it it is like when when it picked me up in 2008, it was already like a 25, 30 year old craft, but it was still in use. Right. Now, when they picked you up, did they beam you up, Scotty, or what type of, how did they pick you up? Uh, well, it's, it's like instantaneous. There's no real realization. So it's of teleportation. It. Yeah, they can actually, um, 
they can actually dematerialize you, um, I guess, just like in Star Trek, and then and then bring you onto the craft. And um, they use uh, they can beam frequencies at you to make you. Uh, it's called entrainment. And um, there's actually an AI aboard the craft as well. Um, and uh, you've, everyone's under like uh, an AI entrainment um, aboard the craft. So you kind of go into this trance and. Um, and that's and that's even before the blank slating. The blank slating happens afterwards. But even when you're um, doing training and you're doing missions and they abduct you, everyone is in like a hypnotic trance. So it's not like um, I, I guess you know what I mean. It's not like people are actually like totally fully aware of what they're even doing aboard the craft. Everyone is totally in a trance. Now, do you have? See, I I go on board ships all the time, and I've been on everything imaginable. Um, I don't think I, 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 I'm in a different category than the, um, the secret space program. I'm, I'm still piecing my story back together, but, um, and I've been interviewing dozens and dozens of uh, secret space program people. There's just, they're, they're all over the place now. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, and I have a friend that was in the, um, secret space program. Well, once you're in, you're always in for one thing. But uh, she was officially in as part of the uh, the Navy. She was actually um, all all the different military. Uh, they were in one joint uh, uh, what do you call it action one joint uh, type of uh, facility. But she was um, on the command level. So I know a couple of people that have been on the command level, where the other people are kind of deferring to them. So. Uh, when they're down in, in their regular life, they're not always aware of their function, but once they're on ship, you know, they're, they're command, right? So I don't, what my, don't know what my level is, but they treat me like royalty. That's all I can say. When I go on board, I'm conscious, I'm lucid, I'm treated like royalty. I come back, um, I return to the, you know, my bed or wherever I was taken from, and I don't even think I'm taken. It's like I go there. I don't know. It's very, it's a different category. And they treat me like, I probably am one of them to some degree. Well, yeah. I, it's funny you said that. Um, uh -huh. uh, just to jump ahead for go a ahead. second. Um, I, uh, uh, I recalled um, at one point uh, there was uh, um, a group of uh, what you would call like Pleiadians or Pleiarans, um, the, the Nordics. And uh, there was a situation where they actually rescued um, my unit. Uh, it's one of the recalls I have. And when they brought us, uh, uh, when they brought us aboard their craft, um, and we were in a sick bay being treated for our injuries. And um, it, it's exactly what you described. That was different. That was um, that wasn't the military. That was the the Pleiadians, uh, but it was the Pleiaran group. Um, and uh, they, yeah, they um, they actually because uh, once I was walking again, um, they actually gave me a tour of like their uh, their ship, and they brought me into the. Um, the uh, the center of the ship where there was like a garden like a uh, like a greenhouse mm -hmm. kind of situation where they grow their food and there were um, uh, elderly pliarans and and children sitting in circles and uh, um, the older pliarans were you know the elders were teaching the children and uh, it was um, just like this virtual uh, they had a holographic sky and they even had like um, but it wasn't just holographic it was um, it had like um, actual steam and clouds like actual clouds um right. and uh and yeah they totally they treated, uh, treated us like like you described like totally friendly we were lucid we were fully conscious and um, they treated us like people instead of um um all my mem memories i have with uh the uh like the solar ward and navy faction right. that that's very militant and you're just treated like a number basically yes there you go so that's a very good description so i am not in their military Oh, they don't treat me like that. Um, but I'm not going to go into my story today. I've said my story a number of times. I'm listening here to listen to yours. And Karen has some uh, interactions, too. We'll go into hers in just a little bit here. Uh, let's go back to more of your story. This is fascinating. And I'm sorry to slow you down, but I just want to totally, you know, grok what you're saying. I want to get it. I really want to get it on the core level. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah that's you. okay. That's okay. I don't mind the questions. Yeah. Um, Okay, so should I continue? <laughs> I just have one more question. So you said that everybody is under AI entrainment, uh, artificial intelligence, and everybody's afraid yeah. of artificial intelligence. But for some reason, when I talk about it, my husband talks about it, 
it's like it's like on some way we have a knowingness and we go, ah, no big deal, it's just AI. <laughs> but other people are afraid they're gonna become AI and blah, blah, blah. So what do you mean by AI entrainment? What's going sure. on? Sure, um, all, all their craft have on board, are run by an onboard AI. And then um, even the uh, facilities um, and also the space stations and satellites, um, it's all run by an artificial intelligence. Uh, and then what they do is they actually entrain their assets so that the, peop the personnel um, are basically being used um, as uh, biological um, computers. Like when you're in the program, you're almost like a cyborg. You do get injected with nanotech. And then when they beam the frequencies at you, they can basically take you over remotely. And, um, it, and that's kind of how the, um, that, 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 that's how they uh, control all their assets. Um, uh, there's no um, infighting. Like in the regular military, of course, you have the discipline, but, um, but you still have personality uh, clashes. You have people uh, sometimes arguing, not getting along. Uh, it's interesting how the SSP, everybody, um, like it's all run like clockwork. There's never an incident. Everyone's like literally walking around like drones, just kind of lost in a trance. And they're basically like robots. And it's running oh, perfectly wow. like a clock. Um, and that's why there's no incidents. That's why there's no, um, like, um, you know what I mean? Like somebody um, um, going AWOL and freaking out or, um, you know what I mean? Or like turning the cloak off the craft to do a mass sighting or whatever. Like everyone is basically a cyborg, They're um, cyborg. in the program. I heard about yeah, that. But this the way you're describing it, it completely makes sense. Now, when you're in that state, uh, what happens to your emotions? Are they repressed or you're just kind of neutral? They... Uh, well, that's the interesting thing um, about my experience is because they brought me uh, uh, onto uh, like into the program um, to be an empath. So there were times when they would turn off the, um, the AI, um, but only during certain situations. And uh, they used me as an ET interface and they would put me in rooms with um, different extraterrestrials and that's when I would become fully lucid again and have all my emotions back because they needed me to, um, to actually interface with um, like telepathically with um, uh, various ETs they had captured. And uh, so that was my role was an ET interface. Uh, they also trained me in remote viewing, which I can talk about at some point. Um, I uh, did remote viewing training on Mars. And um, so they also used me as a remote viewer, but I was mainly used as an ET interface um, but before I uh, get too far into the recalls, I just wanted to um, mention that uh, in 2015, in March of 2015, the craft came back. And uh, at 3.45 a.m., um, my backyard like lit up, and I look outside, and the white TR3 is flying over the house very slowly. It flies over the backyard, and I'm, I'm just like in shock. I'm like, oh, my God. And then at exactly 4 a.m., 15 minutes later, it came right back. And um, I asked Carl about that during my higher self-channeling session, and he said I was re-abducted um, in 2015 again. And um, I did experience, uh, I lied down on the couch after it came back. And um, yeah, same thing, the nausea. But that time it was more because I was so um, like a, a surprised that it had come back after all that time because now it's 2015 yeah. and... Um, I kind of had a, more of like, I wouldn't say I had a seizure, but I was just like lying on the couch, shaking uncontrollably. And yeah, I felt like I was going to throw up. And um, Wow. Yeah, so I just thought okay. I'd get that out there that uh, I was taken twice. Taken twice. Okay, so we'll go over that a little bit more. So I wanted to go back to, um, okay, so you were brought into the program to be an empath. And when you were, you were interfacing with the ETs, they captured, that was, I want to go over that. So I am what they call the key. Um, mm -hmm. when, when, I, when I go to a large meeting, when I go to a meeting, um, there's usually a faction that has a lot of questions of another faction, like the ET faction, and um, I can, they can plug me in and I'm like a supercomputer. And I'm processing stuff in an amazing speed. Uh, like like source like God source speed, and I'm able to um, they ask all their questions simultaneously. It's like outside of time and space, 
I ask all the questions to the appropriate parties that are in this meeting and I get all the answers and I feed it back to everybody. And it's like, it's, it's outside of time and space. It's all, it seems like it's all simultaneous. Um, definitely not in this uh, vibratory frequency, but that's probably why they don't, um, you know, cyborg me because they want me to have that ability to interface with the extraterrestrials. Now I'm in meetings and nobody's captured, but you said that you are interfacing with ETs they captured. Can you um, sure. expand upon yeah, that? Um, sorry, I don't really know your background, but by the, but, but from what you've described so far, it sounds like the, there's uh, the, it's like you're um, you're involved in like the the true ET secret space program um, that's run by extraterrestrials. The 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 program I'm referring to is is the military um, and in particular the Navy faction because the Air Force has their own secret space program as well. Um, but the the Navy faction um, they are um, they uh, have an, an agreement with. Um, a group of greys and um because there's a couple different groups of greys they have a agreement with some greys and with um uh, one nordic faction in particular and um so and what solar warden does is they act as basically air traffic control and the coast guard uh kind of all wrapped up into one but for the solar system so they monitor all the incoming and outgoing traffic and um, for instance on mars uh where uh, Ileana, who you interviewed, she uh -huh. worked for the ICC, and that's another, um, that's um, a private sector um, um, secret space program, um, interplanetary corporate conglomerate, uh, which in terms of tracing back the money, um, uh, the, the 200 richest families in the world, um, especially the nobility families, um, they, they're the ones that fund the ICC, and they have their own, like, breakaway civilization thing going on on Mars, and um, uh, but anyway, before I digress into that, um, the ICC does um, trade with certain extraterrestrials um, that they have uh, made um, uh, agreements with. So what Solar Warden does is it monitors all the incoming and outgoing craft from Mars and, and, and throughout the solar system. So if um, a certain ET race has uh, an agreement to trade with the ICC, they have to follow a certain flight plan. And they have to be in communication with Skull the Warden, which acts as like air traffic control. If there's a, if all of a sudden an ET interloper, an unknown craft or, uh, in, or, or, or crafts, um, just suddenly come into our solar system, um, Solar Warden is sent to intercept and try to make contact. And if they can't make contact, sometimes there are, um, there are uh, battles. And those craft are either chased out of the solar system or, or attacked or destroyed if they uh, aren't um, willing to communicate with uh, Solar Warden. So Solar Warden is doing like the Coast Guard thing, but, but like for the solar system, if that makes sense. That does. Everything you say um, awakens the question within me. So, so there's other, other species coming in. So they don't all have treaties with... Um, Solar Warden and the ICC, so they're unknown. Right. Yeah. So, so there's no like it like in Star Trek attempt to have a peaceful conversation. We're immediately attacking. The Solar Warden is immediately attacking. Is that what you're saying? Or do they? Uh, they they will hail, they'll hail them at first and try to set up like if there's try to set up a communication, a dialogue um, to 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 you know have a meeting and create a treaty. But what what's been happening is there's ET interlopers that literally dart into our solar system and come here to steal resources. And they also come here to steal people. Um, okay. Uh, and genetic sample. So, um, but surprisingly, um, a lot of them will just come here literally to steal water, um, to steal minerals. They will come to like, like shoot in, uh, hover over the earth, quickly try to grab water or, or resources and then try to leave again and basically just take what they need. Um, it's almost like piracy. They'll take right. whatever they need and then, and try to leave and then solar warden's like wait no 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 we we have our own we're capable of like monitoring and defending ourselves so uh you need to actually like uh sign an agreement with us if you're going to do trade with us or um if you want resources from us you actually have to do business with us you can't just come here and um uh like the old days before there was a human secret space program like pre-1950s um or pre-world war ii rather pre-world war ii ET interlopers 
uh, could come into our solar system and steal whatever they wanted and leave again. But after World War II, we started um, developing the means to actually monitor them and then eventually fight back. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to make a note. I'm going to come back to that. That's a, I want to go back one more. I'm making notes as we talk. <laughs> so you said that it seems that I am part of the true ET secret space program, not the military Navy faction. What do you know about the true right. ET secret space program? This is fascinating. We're definitely going to have you back. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, this, uh, this is something that came through uh, during my channeling with Carl. I found out that in previous lifetimes, um, I had also been involved in the ET uh, secret space program, which has always been here. It's been here um, since the dawn of man. And so even um, during hunter-gatherer times, um, you know, like um, ancient history, uh, the medieval era, right up until World War II, basically, um, uh, certain people that had certain gifts, um, certain abilities, and also certain people that had um, the star seeds, uh, people that had, um, uh, I mean, uh, the, human, uh, the human itself is very, has been hybridized uh, immensely. We all have ET DNA, but... Um, Everyone will have something known as um, a prevalent DNA type, which means um, of the um, like 22 sup uh, supposed races that um, comprise the modern day human, um, you might have like a slightly higher percentage of Pleiadian or Andromedan or Syrian. And if you have that slightly higher percentage, there's a good chance that the reason why that DNA is prevalent in you is because uh, on a soul level, you actually, you're actually a star seed. You actually come from Andromeda, let's say. So then like the Andromedan Council is aware that you're um, an Andromedan soul that chose to come to Earth to, to incarnate here as a, a star seed and have a human experience. And so what they'll do is they, um, that's the difference between like a contactee and an abductee. Um, okay. What I'm talking about, like a contactee, like, um, like for instance, you know, like Alex Collar and the Andromedans, yeah. uh -huh. that's a perfect example of like when they when they um, bring Alex onto the craft, um, it's like what you talked about. Um, he's treated with respect. He's treated as an equal because on a soul level he is related to them, and um, and genetically too. So that that's the true ET secret space program that's been here you know throughout human history. But unfortunately, there um, there's the uh, dark factions which abduct people, and that's mm -hmm. that's the Greys and the reptilians and the insectoids. They tend to abduct people and experiment on people. They're very interested in star seeds because they're fascinated with studying the, um, the human soul in general. But then an ET soul in a human body, they're really interested in that. Um, so does that make sense? <laughs> yes, I resemble that remark. Yes, <laughs> that is, uh, I have identified as uh, Anunnaki, but then before that, the Anunnaki, of course, are Pleiadian and uh, different facts. They're, they're a hybrid species of many of the different uh, species that are out there, like the Syrians and the Andromedans. But they're, they're all, um, uh, that faction of me is, uh, what do you call it, uh, humanoid. But somehow, and I can't quite figure this out, I was led to the dragon, I call it the dragon at the center of the earth, but it wasn't the center of the earth. It was underneath Johnson Atoll, and it was a huge ritual. There were greys, there were, um, I, I think they were the Anunnaki, I asked them, were these the Anunnaki? They were between 7 and, and 12 feet high. Um, they were the very tall, uh, there were three types of greys, very tall, um, it was like a mantis gray hybrid. And anyway, there was a huge ritual. Everybody was dressed like Victorian ages or even before. And we went down in these full costumes to the to a lower cave. There was a giant wall. Um, I stood, I was the key. They kept saying, is today the day? Is it going to happen today? Is she the key? Is she the one? So I stood in, in a circle of light and it made the wall dissolve. And it was a gigantic, <laughs> ginormous um, dragon, the dragon's real, and and that was the one they they wanted to know. They wanted to ask this dragon. It was female. All the questions. Somehow, I'm related to her too. So, don't think in terms of your form, but what DNA runs within your body and what DNA runs within your soul. So these are we're, we're um, symbiotic beings, and we can have many incarnations, in many levels, and many dimensions, and vibratory frequencies. But that's what I get. So what you say makes sense. 
and you too are one of them, even though, in, yeah, if you were in the previous life, we're still that, that soul base, right? Yeah, you're still of that essence. Yeah. That's why they're really yeah, actually, interested um, in you. The reason, yeah, that's, um, that's why they're interested in me. And actually, that's why, um, um, well, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, and I skipped over a lot, but um, there was an instant. Uh, the, the reason why my group, um, was rescued by the Pleiarans is because, um, uh, like on a star seed level, I resonate with the Pleiadian Pleiaran, um, group. And, um, in a previous life, I had a lifetime in the Pleiades and they had watched, they had watched over me my whole life. And before this lifetime, I was involved in like what you were involved in, uh, in the ET, um, secret space program in, in my past lives. Um, and then, but what happened in this lifetime is, um, I found out my great uncle Bill was um, a lieutenant and a communications officer uh, for the Navy uh, and served on a ship uh, during World War II. And he also served on a ship in Korea. And for, and for his service, he became a th third degree Freemason. And um, when he passed away, um, now I'm not a Mason, I'm not into that sort of thing, but mm -hmm. I inherited his, his, his Navy ring and his uh, Mason ring. And um, and in the Masonic tradition, um, the, the rank and the title in terms of being a Mason and um, is supposed to pass to the oldest male heir. And I'm his eldest nephew. And I'm my cousin, my older cousin, he had a daughter. So, she, I mean, she got his war medal. She got, you know, um, like his inheritance. But I got his um, Mason ring and his um, Navy ring, um, which I, you know, I still have. And um, uh, so... That's, that's how I was able to piece together why the Soul Award and Navy faction abducted me when I was 19 years old, because in Canada, that's the age of majority. It's when, you know, you're legally an adult. My uncle had just passed away a couple of years prior. I, I, you know, I inherited his, his rings and um, they, they grabbed me to basically continue this, um, the service of like my family being a World War II Navy family. They grabbed me as the next, the next one, the next generation. Um, so that's how I was able to piece that together. So, and a lot of experiencers who, um, have, uh, had involvement with the, the Soul Award and Navy faction, they, they usually have some relative that served, fought in World War II and, and usually served in the Navy. And there's always this World War II connection, not always, but a lot of the time it's a World War II connection. They, they track World War II families. So, and then, um, and then when they need, um, you know, the next generation, They'll, they'll abduct the, the child or the grandchild of someone that fought in World War II because they're just obsessed with, with that era because that was the birth of the human secret space program. And um, so they're still tracking World War II families and they want, they want the grandchildren now and the great-grandchildren to serve in the program. Very interesting. Yeah, my father, I'm, I'm older, I'm 64 in a couple of days on the 6th of February. My father served in World War II. He was in the Army, but he was somehow associated with the Navy because, um, you know, I, I don't know what his surface story was, but he, he would um, log all the ships. Now, for what they, uh, Bill Tompkins says, a lot of the ships were taken into space and retrofitted as space uh, ferrying vehicles. So my yes. father was fascinated with these ships until he died. So I think that it was a cover story that he was in the army, but he was something with the Navy. And his father and my mother's father were both Masons, very high, to, high up, like supposed to be 33 degree or whatever, uh, the highest you can go. And so my family was, was uh, pulled together to breed together. So both factions we're part of these masons, uh, so we would breed together. Well, so. But there you go, there you go, and um, and yeah, nowadays the the army and air force have their own secret space program, but they had to play catch up. Um, initially, the first real human uh, secret space program, aside from what the Nazis were doing, what I'm talking about is like in the West, um, it, it was the Navy because of what you just described. It's because their um, personnel were already trained to survive on a craft on a ship. And um, they, what they did initially, and these are the cigar-shaped craft, but that's the Solar Warden Carrier, um, they would retrofit uh, submarines and they would become space-faring submarines. And that was like one of the first craft they used was a retrofitted space sub. So Fascinating. Yeah. So, so before, uh, so during World War II, uh, you had the Nazi program. So from what you know, where did the Nazis get their ships? 
who was uh, what faction of the ETs were supporting the the Nazis in their advancement of technologies? Right. Yeah. Uh, so the Nazis, um, I guess technically the Nazis um, beat us like to the punch uh, in terms right. of like developing a secret space program. They they had actually developed a secret space program as of the 1930s, but they had help and they received help uh, from the Draco, from the reptilians. Uh, and basically the Draco um, gave them um, t uh, technical like specifications on how to perfect their anti-grav and how to build a uh, craft uh, that um, could you know, take them off planet and off planet. So the Nazis were the first ones that made it to the moon and they made it to Mars, like as of the 1930s and, and 40s. And, um, and they, uh, they are still out there. They, they are a breakaway civilization. Um, the Fourth Reich is, uh, doesn't really have a presence on the earth anymore, but they, um, when they lost the war in Germany, um, or sorry, I should say the German army lost the war in Germany and the German right. people lost the war, but but the uh, German Navy and and the Luftwaffe, um, when they 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 left the planet um, after the war, and I mean they have enclaves in South America and they have a base right. in Antarctica, in the Schwabenland, and um, how I actually know um, some primary source material is my Oma on the other side of the family, uh, she grew up in Nazi Germany and Austria, and oh. I asked her about New Schwabenland. Yeah, so yeah, so on one side. Uh, I got like my, my mom's side of the family is the uncle in the Navy on the fighting for the allies. And then on my dad's side of the family, that's the German side. <laughs> and, um, and uh, so I asked my Oma, I'm like, uh, did they ever teach you in school about Antarctica? And she's like, Oh yeah, sure. New Schwabenland, uh, the Antarctica expedition. Uh, yeah. They sent the U boats down there. And so, <laughs> so to me, that's not conspiracy now because they, my Oma was actually taught that in school. And for me, that's primary source. You theory. say Oma? Is that a, a German word for grandma? Yeah, yeah, Oma. She uh, uh, she's going to be eighty four next week. Eighty four next week. Okay, so she's a little bit yeah. younger than my parents, but she's in that uh, that age group there. Wow. So this is fascinating piece. I'm sorry, Karen. I'm leaving you out. <laughs> we'll pull you in. I'm just. Um, I'm on a roll here. What can I say? This is wonderful. So I have the same, um, well, see, my family is uh, UK, British, and German. But if you if you research the, uh, the royals, you know, British royals, they're German. They have so much German blood. It isn't funny. So the Nazis, in fact, um, Edward, the one that advocated, he went over and he was hanging out with Hitler, you know, in, in um, pre-World War II and uh, – he actually wanted to come back and take over the British throne. He advocated to his brother, but he had a plot to take it back. And um, so he was uh, caught and not uh, allowed to do that. But that was part of the whole thing. Fascinating series on, what is it on? Uh, Netflix, I think Netflix on uh, The Crown. And you get the different perspective of what was going on, a little bit behind the scenes. And then there's a couple of documentaries. But, um, okay, so so your Oma, Oma was down there, and she could be 84, so she's uh, born in the 30s, right, or late 20s? Yeah, yeah, she was born in the 30s, so she was, like, during the war, she was, like, five, six, seven, eight years old, so she was, like, basically in, like, kindergarten, grade one and grade two, being mm -hmm. taught about the Antarctica expedition to New Schwabenland, and even back then, they were, they told even the little kids um because it was for morale it was for and also propaganda right. uh they, they were telling them like yeah we got the u-boat fleet down there um you know uh we built a fortress for the fewer uh fewer you know like an impregnable right. fortress like so they were telling them that like that because of this antarctica base they had that they would never be defeated because we could always send the german high command to antarctica and 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 no one could touch us kind of thing um, right so, and then um yeah. Uh, what was this guy, guy that went down, the American that went down there that got defeated? Oh, what's his name? Drawing a, a blank. Admiral Byrd. Byrd, yeah. So Byrd, so, okay, so I got to tie into the, the cigar-shaped. Uh, so sure. apparently the cigar-shaped craft are, are reptilian. When I was... Oh, no, sorry. Those are the, uh, the, the cigar-shaped craft are the Solar Warden Navy um, craft. Uh, they, uh, so that American craft. Oh, they're American. So there was a, there is a picture of um, 
bird being defeated and they have a cigar shape. I don't know. So I'm getting mixed up, but I thought that they, they said that, well, at least maybe the, the um, David uh, Wilcock version is that the cigar shaped craft are down there in Antarctica. So that's not American, but or maybe they they have the same I think, craft. I think the, uh, if I, if, because um, I did look into like, uh, yeah, David Wilcox, uh, um, Antarctica information, and um, if, if how I under, understand it is uh, the, the the dark fleet fourth right craft are like the massive triangles, like massive, like like what you see in Star Wars, like the star destroyers. Uh, yeah, and those are the ones that are um, underneath the water in Antarctica and and off planet. And the um, uh, the cigar shaped craft is what um, uh, like uh, what. William uh, or Bill uh, Tompkins talks about right. uh, actually designing a building. Um, those are the the Navy space carriers. Okay. Um, that so that's Bill Tompkins. He talks about um, having help from a Nordic faction to help them build the cigar shaped craft, and um, and then the uh, what the uh, Fourth Reich Nazis had they had the they had the the Vril craft, the little discs as fighters, right. uh-huh. and then they but then their like their motherships are like these giant. Like basically exactly what you see in Star Wars, um, big star destroyer, triangular shaped craft. But these things are like interstellar. They can actually leave the solar system. They're massive. Okay, so when I was twelve, I I, I was coming home from playing. It was uh, I was I was late, so it was dark. I should be home before dark or whatever. Um, and I turned around because I felt something staring at me. At the treetop, there was a cigar-shaped craft. And it was so low, there were actually windows. And I could see people looking out at me. And what was really weird was all the crickets stopped. And there was no traffic. It's like they stopped traffic, stopped all the animal sounds. <laughs> and I'm just looking at this. And I, I was looking for the longest time. And I finally said to them telepathically, telepathically, thank you for showing yourself to me. I'm going to go in now. I'm supposed to be at home. And I just turned and left. And when I think back, and it's so surreal, but I had seen so many craft as a young person on this planet that it was like, oh, you again. What do you want now? So um, this was absolutely fascinating. I love what you're doing. Okay, sorry for all the interruptions, and we're only going to go about an hour. And I did. I said it open ended, but we can, uh, whenever you, you feel it's enough, we can stop, and we'll have you back again. And I should let me have Karen say something. Hi, Karen. Sorry, I know you're back there with your hand up. What would you like to ask? Oh, I've been. Oh, I've been so excited about listening to this because. I have those same uh, connections. I had a, 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 a my, one of my my biological grandfather was in the merchant marines and encountered the U boats, and we we think that he was uh, part of a when they were sinking ships. In so it's kind of a situation where the merchant marine guys were before the war was declared. They were participating in the war on the Allied side, sneaking armaments and supplies from America to uh, Europe. And the U-boats are just mopping up with them. And then, uh, you know, uh, so I've got some of those connections as well, as, as well as uh, recent uh, pretty strong confirmation that I'm, I'm in those, those programs doing similar things in terms of uh, ET liaison, um, as well as something that I've identified as the Psychic Sentinel program, so it's using psychic to monitor and track a whole bunch of things. Kind of similar to remote viewing, but actually could be even more, uh, the, the term I was taught was extension neurosensing, so it's not just viewing, it's like totally, almost bilocating energetically for intel for all kinds of purposes. Um, you, you have saw, oh my gosh, Kevin, you have solved a mystery for me, thank you, and I'll tell you what it is. When you were talking about the retrofitted subs and Navy ships, I've had a, uh, these persistent dream sequences throughout my life, and I pretty much identify them now as memories or future memories. And in this one dream sequence, um, there literally are what looks like battleships uh, hovering over Navy shipyards. And I say, oh, well, no, I probably had a hundred dreams about this. And I, I, and uh, they were up in the sky. It was totally silent. 
And there was two things going on. One, there was these tiny little scout ships that looked almost like a clear bubbles uh, going up and down. I never seem to see inside the ships, but I'm, I'm going up and down from the ground up towards them. And then um, the other part of it was uh, the all the airplanes had switched to VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. It could either be the traditional VTOL or they just simply had, uh, you know, reverse gravitics. But uh, basically, I'm looking at the secret space program Navy is what you're telling me. And so, you know, this is like a validation. Um, and apparently my involvement was uh, uh, – several things. So what was confirmed to me over the Christmas time was I was involved in uh, monitoring and finding people uh, who have teleported or have even time traveled and gone to Mars through the jump room program. So I was kind of involved uh, extensively in that. Um, I had validation that there's sort of another me. Um, it could be a cloning situation or it could also be a time multiple but somebody uh, either i got pulled into the same timeline as them or vice versa and uh that was validated to me over the christmas holidays but yeah it's interesting about the zombification and then like when they need to use you for a psychic they have to kind of release you because it jams your you know jams your airwaves <laughs> and um so uh very easy tell empathic contact with different beings and then I would say my – I was fascinated with your story about the person channeling your higher self because I think I've been talking to my higher self for quite some time. And, uh, you know, now now I'm understanding what I was, was experiencing. And then I think uh, one of the things I've been trying to figure out is I know that there's a lot of talk about cloning. And I'm thinking, well, if they clone this, what do they need to use this for the secret space grant program for? And then uh, what I found out, too, is that if they clone us, then it, you get the twin effect. So one of the other programs the Nazis were doing was Joseph Mengele's um, studies of twins. He, it was really gruesome what he was doing for the concentration camp. But he was able to determine that, uh, you know, this effect of a, a natural psychic ability between uh, twins that I think may have been extended to try and understand when that is involving clones or when that's involving multiple. So I was wondering if you had any experiences or thoughts on uh, this type of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, before I answer that, um, what you just described really sounds like the, the Navy secret space program, like based on everything you just said. Because um, the Air Force program is a little different. So um, based on like what you just described, that sounds more like the Navy secret space program. And um, after I, I went public, um, I got into communication with Anthony Zender, who is an ex-Marine, he's an MMA fighter now, but he's an ex-Marine. And um, I, I've done a couple interviews with him as well, like round tables, really nice guy. And he was actually able to share some documents with me that, uh, that he got. And uh, it goes over the, it outlines the 24 roles of the SSP, but it also uh, talks about cloning. And because um, I, I, I basically asked him the same question that you just asked me. I'm, uh, I'm like, is it um, like, 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 are, is it the, is the secret space program cloning people? And it's basically the clones that are actually up in space. You know what I mean? And, um, and then the, the original is, is still left on the earth. Because I, I was, I was always wondering about that. Like when they picked me up in 2008, I'm like, did they just bring me aboard to clone me and like abduct me, get a sample, and then they put me back, and then my clone served in the SSP? And he, and his answer was, well, it kind of works both ways because what they do is they do clone you, but your clone doesn't have any of your natural gifts. So if you are a remote viewer, an empath, a psychic, um, a hands-on healer, whatever it might be. Um, uh, your clone is it's, it has all of your memories and mannerisms, and it's 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 almost like you, but it doesn't have any of your natural genius. So, like to use this example, like if they cloned Mozart, Mozart would be more like a Salazari. He wouldn't have like uh, his. He wouldn't be able to write any brand new symphonies. So, anyway, so what they do is um, when they need your gifts, uh, they can. Um, uh, actually rip your consciousness. Uh, they call it your frequency number. They know what your frequency number is. Um, so they can take your frequency and, and put it in the clone. And then 
that's when you are, ha that's when you wake up and you're having like this really vivid, lucid dream where you're like um, actually using your gifts and you're in the secret space program. But then when they're done with you, that they uh, put your, your, your original consciousness back into your body and, um, and then your clone remains, if that makes sense. So it kind of answers the question of how you can be two places at once because your clone can be serving in the SSD. Is that because, um, you know, space travel and being in these different environments is very detrimental to, in the long run uh, to your body. My friend was um, openly in the secret space program and her husband, by the time he was done serving all these years, um, he, he needed to have, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, a new kidneys, you know, he was on dialysis and he was very, very sick. And they said, if you stay up on ship, we can repair you. Um, but they didn't have the technology back on earth. If he chose to come back to earth and died. And I, and I said to my girlfriend, what, what happened to Tom that he was so sick and something about the extended exposure to things in space. So accelerate his aging process and, and made him sick and he died. And so uh, somebody else said, that's why they, they don't always take the original body, but that makes sense that they can take your consciousness and you have experiences in what you think is your body, but it's your clone, and it puts you back because they're protecting the original body, the original avatar of the person who was born. So I guess your your talents come from your soul because your, your yeah, genetic yeah. clone is just a, a clone of your uh, genes, but it's, a, it's a, basically a different... Um, yeah, it's, it's not you. Right, yeah, yeah. And like most starseeds understand that um, that the body is just a vehicle for the consciousness to experience. It's a genetic space suit. And then like literally in the secret space program, it's a genetic space suit. And uh, that's why they, yeah, they tend to like to keep the originals on Earth. And then when they need you, um, they abduct your consciousness. This is a consciousness thing. They're actually, they have the technology now to literally grab your frequency and just put it in your clone body. Now, because it is you, because it's your twin, um, it's like two tuning forks. You, you're resonating at such a at close frequency, just like um, when Karen mentioned Dr. Um, uh, Mangala being obsessed with twins. Mm -hmm. um, he was studying like, like um, this is where that comes from, is because if you have an exact copy of you, it is actually, it's so much easier for your consciousness to just grab onto your clone body and vice versa, the clone consciousness can then just be put into your original body as a placeholder. And then that, that actually enables you to, A, be two places at once, technically, but then B, um, it solves the whole problem of actually taking somebody, um, like, all the time, bringing them up into space, and they're exposed to radiation. Yes. Uh, if there's an accident, and they get cut in half, and, and, and they're not able to repair you, even, even with their advanced medical technology, um, if, if there's an, an incident where you get incinerated, it's, even they can't put you back together right. if you're incinerated. So then, it, then it becomes like, uh, like why did this person just go to bed one night and then he wasn't there in the morning and there's right. no trace? Like that'd be very suspicious if that kept happening. So solves that problem. Oh, that's very interesting. So um, I don't know if you know who Neil Freer is. Neil Freer was a researcher that was an Anunnaki researcher, and he was in his 80s, and he, was, he knew he was dying. He was uh, having congenital heart failure. So he preserved his, his uh, head. So he's got his head frozen. But if they can clone from the head, he could actually, they, you know, maybe, you know, whatever, this technology or somebody else, they can... Um, move his consciousness into his clone body and he could be res basically resurrected. So if that's, if I'm following this correctly, it may be a good idea if you really want to <laughs> come back to, you know, freeze your head or something. Uh, there is a catch with that. There still has to be electrical activity in the head. Uh, if they, if, if you lose the electrical, that's what I mean by like, they can repair, like if you get cut in half and they're able to, put you into stasis and there's still electrical activity in the brain, they can um, clone um, your, uh, like the other half of your body and they can literally put you back together like one cell at a time. That's not an issue. It's just if, they, if the electrical activity is gone, then essentially the consciousness, the, the radiant field of energy, what some people might call an aura, like once that leaves the body and go like, you know, then you're dead. You're not coming back. Um, at least not in this 
incarnation. Well, they have so. living corpses now. Where they, you know, how when you when you die, and the life support can really maintain your body almost indefinitely. But they usually uh, have you come and say farewell to your loved one if they're brain dead and they disconnect it, and the body follows shortly after they disconnect life support. So now what they're doing because of, uh, you know, transplants and all kinds of other things that Lord knows what they're doing is they keep the body going. So, you know, the person dies, they let the soul leave and they go flatline. They're, they're officially declared, declared uh, dead. And then they re animate the body, it, it, not animate, but they re uh, wire it. They plug it back in and just start this, <laughs> maintaining it. Uh, for future harvesting of organs, or maybe they are uh, doing some kind of cloning with these bodies that they're they're living corpses. Uh, the soul is gone. Right. Fascinating. Yeah, that could work. That could work. Uh, although that's a perfect like recipe for a walk-in because another consciousness can come into that body and not be the original consciousness. So well, that gets into another that question about it. walk-ins. Do walk-ins have to be a similar vibratory frequency? From my understanding, that souls have a genetic, have a number. They have a, like a, a sequence. Of, they, there's no two souls alike. It's the same. Oh, so they, they have to kind of match the, the the numbers and the frequency of the souls and the avatar to some degree in order for them to be a fit for the symbiotic relationship they have while they're alive on the earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you're finding? Something like that. You bet you something about that earlier, but I didn't catch it in the notes. About um, anyway, we digress. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, we did kind of digress. But just to answer Karen's question about cloning, um, just in short, like after all that, basically, yeah, they they are cloning people, and um, they can uh, uh, take your consciousness, put you into your clone body. You can serve off planet and be, uh, you know, two places at once, essentially. And that answers the whole question of how you can be like an active SSP service member. And um, in terms of your original body, after they initially abduct you and clone you, your original body isn't going anywhere, but your consciousness is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, What is our time here? Uh, What time did we start? We started... Uh, actually, we started at a quarter after eight, so we're about 55 minutes in, I think. Um, yeah. I, I don't mind going a little longer. Like, we can go a little longer if okay, that's okay. Okay, let's continue. Yes, let's continue. I, I'm just um, not normally on my clock system. I'm on this one, and I, it doesn't show you anything. I don't know what we're, you know, the other system, they, they show you that you're running out of time or whatever, so I'm not even going to this. But I think we're pretty, I think I set the clock for two hours, so we could just call it quits when we feel complete. And I definitely, if you will come back, would love to have you back on again, because I think we've just begun. But go ahead. What is the next um, thing that you want to tell our listeners about uh, sure, I can uh, talk. Yeah, I can talk about some of my recalls. Um, uh, like initially, um, uh, in terms of my timeline, and um, I was actually fortunate enough to um, meet Tony Rodriguez in person um, about a week after I went public. He reached out to me, so I got to actually meet with the guy, and he helped me develop a timeline, just to, as best you can, uh-huh. um, and and so and to try to kind of put it in chronological order a little bit, just to organize your thoughts. And I recommend this for any uh, SSP experiencer, abductee, contactee, if you haven't written out a timeline, um, it's really, really helpful. It's like a mind map that way it just organizes your thoughts. And then that way too, if you ever go public, you can kind of stay on point because it's so easy to go off on tangents and digress. And, and, um, so yeah. So, um, during my timeline, um, I remember I first, um, being taken to the Arctic, actually, it was, there was a base in the Arctic Um, It was like this big sinkhole and the TR3 uh, lowered into it and then um, cut into the side of the sinkhole. Um, The TR3 flew into the side of this um, like underground base. And um, so that's like one of my first recalls and on my timeline. And then just moving ahead slightly, uh, the next uh, set of recalls I have um, is definitely the Lunar Operations Command moon base. Um, It was a crater, the small dome in the center of the crater. The TR3, um, like, lowered into this dome, and um, they, they showed me off the craft, and there's a couple other people with us, and at that point, we were in these dark teal-colored um, jumpsuits, 
And uh, they took us down into a corridor and there were about 30 people lined up in this corridor, uh, standing at ease and just staring um, at the wall. And they lined us up and we were uh, supposed to stand there and just wait for everyone to get there. So that was when we were cadets. That's when we were first brought to the LOC. Um, at the LOC, there were classes um, on just like a typical projector screen. And they were uh, talking about, um, they actually taught, uh, they, they taught us the, uh, the, the densities, like first density, second density, third density, fourth and fifth. Um, uh, they, t- they taught us all these densities, but, uh, as, um, but in terms of dimensional ecology. So um, they explained this as um, like, like, this is a matter of a fact. This isn't a belief system. This isn't a spiritual thing. This is um, the, vib- the different vibratory states of matter. Most people are familiar with the law of one. Uh, they didn't call it the law of one. They didn't mention that. But when I um, came across the law of one, I was like, oh, my God, this is what they taught us. Like first density, life, second density, life, all the way up uh, the octaves. Um, so they taught us that. Um, an interesting thing at the LOC, they, they did teach us this thing about prevalent uh, DNA. So uh, it's like what I mentioned before, that if someone on a soul level is from a particular group, um, there's this thing called the law of transference. So, um, so they will pull the consciousness will actually pull more of us, more of the Syrian DNA out of the human DNA, which um, has like the, the combined um, like 22 combined races. That's what a homo sapien is. It's a, right. a, a, hi, a hybrid on top of a hybrid on top of a hybrid 22 times. So there's that template there, but there's actually 22 different body types um, on the planet. And that has to do with the prevalent, DNA on a soul level. So what they did to interest, introduce us to this. Now, now of course, this, the power of suggestion is very right. powerful. So, but but I'll just explain this recall I have where they said that okay, your instructor she's a mantid, so she her, she has a higher percentage uh, because on a soul level she is um like a, a mantid, an insectoid. So when this girl and she was only about 18, 19 years old, but she was an instructor. She, she walks out and I mean, she looks human, but there's this slight, just the way she carried herself, um, the shape of her body, her body type, um, the shape of her head and her eyes. She, she looked a little primantis, like a little mantid like, uh-huh. and so, so they were demonstrating that, you know, everyone's like this and they, they taught us how to pick out um, a person's um, prevalent DNA type, uh, like starseed. Uh, ET DNA. So that that's some um, that's some LOC stuff. Um, but something I wanted to to talk about um, um, during this interview um, before we go is uh, the recall I had with uh, Ileana. Um, okay. Who you interviewed. Yeah. So that was the next phase. So we had a couple months of training at the LOC, and then they took us to Mars. But they loaned us out. Are you say LOC. ICC. LOC is what's that stand for? Lunar uh, Lunar Operations okay. Command. Lunar. Okay. Right. Yeah, the moon base. Um, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, in terms of my timeline, first we're taken to the Arctic, then we're taken to the moon, and then from the moon, um, we're we're taken to Mars for additional training. But this is um, this is where it gets a little weird because um, um, the the Solar Board and Navy faction actually um, didn't have a presence on Mars, and they actually facilitated a lot of their training or additional training after the initial like boot camp, um, uh, they uh, initi- uh, sorry, facilitated their training to the ICC. So they, um, uh, like people in business will understand what that means when you actually get a company to do something for you. Right. You pay like a contractor, like a private contractor. So uh-huh. they hired one of the ICC groups to train some of their personnel. Mm-hmm. And what this was, this was like the, the next stage of our training. Um, uh, for me, um, I'm actually a rhesus positive, and uh, most people in the program are actually rhesus negative, and there's a reason for that, and that has to do with um, uh, rhesus negative, absorbs more oxygen more quickly into the body, so they're very explosive. They have a lot of the kinetic psychic abilities. Um, most of the super soldier types and uh, soldier types are rhesus negatives, like Anthony Zender, rhesus negative. He's a, he's a true super soldier fighter guy. Um, I'm a rhesus positive, uh, so I absorb less oxygen into my body, which means I'm not as explosive, but I, um, I have a much higher endurance level. So what I was able to figure out is in my program, when they sent us to Mars, they were 
they were, they were doing this redundancy training where they wanted to put the rhesus positives up at, um, and test them against the rhesus negatives because they were already heavily invested in rhesus negative blood uh, for their assets. But they wanted, as a redundancy, to see how rhesus positives would fare against the rhesus negatives. So this is where um, Ileana comes into it because they, um, there was me and um, about, you know, like 20 of us and and they bring us into this underground cavern on Mars, and there's this pool, like a pool of water. And they had us jump into this pool, except when you jumped in, you realized that uh, this was a massive pool. It, was, it looked like it was made by giants. And and once you jumped into the pool, um, it was a it was at least like the, the edges of the pool were about 15 feet high from the water. So like once you jumped in you realize there wasn't a ladder and you couldn't get out again. Wow. And um, so they had us wading water, like treading water, treading water. And then Ileana walked out and she telepathically was telling us, she was just standing there, but, but, you know, also telepathically like giving us suggestions. And what she had us doing was we had to tread the water, tread the water, but they wanted us to actually use our psychic ability um, uh, in terms of like Qigong to actually make um, an energy bubble around us in the water. And, and they're trying to teach us how to channel energy. And I guess the water was like an amplifier of our, our of our ki. And we, it was much easier to like get an energy bubble around you in the water as a training exercise. And so, uh, but the only way you could tread water long enough and not drown was actually to use your key and create an energy bubble around you. If you if you tried to if you weren't actually doing the key gong exercise and actually channeling your your psychic energy, then um, just brute force alone, uh, people were um, drowning. And wow. that's like an, an, it's a pretty like scary memory I have of like twenty of us jump into a pool and people started drowning, and those are the people that either didn't use their key or they just weren't able to channel enough of their energy um, to stay afloat long enough because, you know, even if you use your key based on your, your energy level, you might, you know, um, drop out eventually. And uh, that, that is another thing they, um, going back to the LOC, they did show us a chart and it was a megahertz chart. And they explained that like the average human human resonates between like 50 and 60 megahertz and that um, like a fourth density being that we might encounter will we'll be resonating at like 350 megahertz uh, and um, in terms of like their aura and um, they're so powerful. Those are the ones that can like literally reach into your mind and like read your thoughts. Mm -hmm. They can also put thoughts into your mind too. Right. Um, so that, and uh, that's the thing about a fourth density being fourth density, like third and fourth density occupies the same space, it's still physical, but a fourth density being uh, they're, how you become a fourth density being is you raise your megahertz to, from like 60 megahertz to like 350. And at that point, you're fully telepathic, um, fully psychic. You, you, you can read, um, you can not only read people's thoughts, but you can also um, speak in people's minds and they can hear you. And um, that's why fourth density beings typically um, don't vocally say things. They just look at you and you know what they're thinking. Right. They communicate telepathically. And that's how they do that. It's a megahertz thing. So, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the recalls I have of Elena. I call her Elena, my Canadian accent, Elena, Eliana. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eliana. Yeah, Elena. Um, yeah, she was uh, definitely an ICC instructor. Uh, she taught Qigong, and she taught us how to channel energy, basically. And, uh, and then also on Mars, um, another uh, group we are um, – loaned out to for uh training was um the templars believe it or not they wow. the templars were one uh -huh. of the icc groups and they taught remote viewing and that but the remote viewing they taught was how to interface with drones and fly drones with your mind so that so it was synthetic telepathy and synthetic remote viewing and instead of like um you know like um like a, like what courtney brown at the far side institute right. teaches uh -huh where like you can actually use your natural human ability to remote view. Um, they were using technology and what they were doing was they're, uh, they were getting you uh, to like interface with drones 
and fly the drones through like a neural interface that actually um, used, so you could actually fly little drones with your mind and that had a camera on it and you could actually remote view using a drone. And so they called that remote viewing, but it's a part of this transhumanist cyborg program where you can, on a consciousness level, um, interface with, you know, like the little drones that people are flying now with remote control, except it's, it's, it's a consciousness based technology so that you're, you're flying a drone half, you know, halfway around the world with your mind. Um, and you can see in real time, um, you know, what's going on, you know, which is almost like a form of bilocation if you can see in real time. And I guess the reason um, why they prefer the, the, the technology uh, um, like way of doing it is because if you're like remote viewers are very, very accurate, but there's always that human level, human error, right? And at least this way, when, when they can get um, a remote viewer to interface with a drone and the drone has a camera on it, then the person, um, you know what I mean? Like the, right. that way there's no room, uh, like there's no error there. Like they know 100% right. that this person is actually fully in, like uploaded to the drone and is actually seeing um, what's happening. Right. And um, yeah. 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 So I, they taught I, that. I've remote viewed into locations, but I guess I'm in my astral body, but you think you're invisible, but sometimes they can detect you. So it's like, oops, get out of there. Um, I had a, I, just a, an insight here. Uh, Russ Kellett, the super soldier fellow from the UK. Have you ever heard of Russ Kellett? He's, he found himself interacting with the Templars. So may, he finds himself in the middle of battles and they're fighting, like he's marching and fighting um, strange extraterrestrial species and um, his um, commander is extraterrestrial ordering him to and the other troops to fight other extraterrestrials so but he said that at one point he was in with the Knights Templar so maybe he was um, on Mars said, on Mars he may he didn't know where he was but yeah the, the Templars they they had him do some training somewhere. So I'll have to talk to him again, or maybe I have the two of you on a show together or something. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question. This is absolutely fascinating. Maybe we should wrap this up for this segment and do another one. Um, I actually have a show. What is today? Today's uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Saturday. If uh, I don't know what your availability is Saturday, but maybe you come back sometime next week. I uh, wanted to know about, this is fascinating, about the, the uh, 22 different body types because of the 22 different races that have been used for our uh, different hybridization programs over the many, 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 many years. Do you know what 22 species, what those 22 species are? Has anybody ever cataloged that that you've uh, seen? I remember, I remember most of them um, more in terms of the xenotypes in terms of like some were insectoid, some were reptilian, some were um, mammalian, including um, feline, um, primate, and canine. Um, and uh, there's also amphibian as well. Um, so there, it's quite an amalgam. And um, now I'm not, I am by no means a mathematician, but I, I was kind of like, thinking about this and because they said that we're 98% human and there's we're 2% um, you know ET and within that 2% is the 22 different types so I was thinking about it and I'm like okay so um, what happens if you take um, 2% and you divide it by 22 and what you get is you get like 0 0.09 0 0.09 0 0.09 and I remember um, when I was reading Courtney Brown's book, um, when he remote viewed the greys, he said that they were obsessed with the number nine. Mm. And the greys are the ones that do the abductions and they're the ones that are, you know, the tinkerers, like they tinker with DNA and they're obsessed with um, genetics. And um, I mean, there's, there's a couple different groups of greys, but definitely the tall greys, they, um, they, they're the ones that may have been, uh, may have had, uh, might have been the hands-on ones that actually um, gave us the missing link, actually tinkered with our DNA and put, uh, created Homo sapien 
alongside oh, the reptilian. Well, what but, we've but been they are obsessed about with the is, the, is the Anunnaki story. We, we, my husband and I have written four books on the Anunnaki story, and we studied with Zechariah Sitchin for years and years, and uh, based on the translation. So uh, there was a species that was roaming here, you know, the uh, Homo erectus, and yeah. and then the Anunnaki, uh, you know, combined DNA and created Homo sapiens. And then they did a subsequent uh, genetic influxing of more Anunnaki DNA to make Homo sapiens sapiens. So, right. but, but even the Anunnaki were hybrid species because they talk about um, the royals and, you know, they were, they were a uh, galactic traveling species, right? So they had their own abilities and yeah they had the royal marriages yeah, and they used grays they definitely um they were in like the the anunnaki uh used grays um as well like um to to do the abductions and that um uh -huh. they would use grays and um what's interesting is um when i was looking at robert morning's guy's material ter uh, terror papers he, mm -hmm. um and that's a that's the Hopi perspective on this they called the the grays the the shet -ti, the or the shet too and 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 that meant uh, had two meanings. The first meaning was um, the shadow beings, like shadow. But then uh -huh. the second meaning means to seize or abduct. And like, who are the ones that do the abductions? The greys. Right. So the Shep two um, are the servants of the Anunnaki and the um, like Hopi, um, Robert Morning Sky, uh, Terror Papers material, which I thought was fascinating because you're right, the Anunnaki are hybrids. Um, one, I know one, there's a couple of different Anunnaki factions, but one faction in particular, they were half Syrian, and half Draco, so they were half reptilian and, and half Syrian wolfmen. So that's where you get King Anu of the Anunnaki, Anubis, the wolf-headed god from Sirius, has these children, these hybridized children, and creates his faction of the um, Anunnaki, which are half Syrian wolfmen and half Draco reptilian. Ah, oh, okay, but they they look humanoid. So it looks are deceiving. These beings mm -hmm. look humanoid. Um, but it's it's more than what their appearances are. It's what's within their DNA, and so there's a right. to look. What, you can look how you want to look at some level. Um, but then that that uh, the body types that you said when it comes through that I'm stuck on that. <laughs> you know, like the mantis was 18, 19 years old. She looked human, but when you look closer, you saw the mantis part coming through her. I'm trying to identify what my body type is. But I'm definitely like the bastard mind of the of the British royals, British German royals. So I'm some kind of, um, you know, O negative bastard line. I, I, well, I remember, my, um, yeah, my DNA. I I go back there. My DNA for this avatar goes back there. Uh, but go ahead. Remember what? Yeah, in terms of in terms of like the physical body that you you see in the mirror, uh, you're 98 percent primate. We're all 98 percent primate. So with, uh, the, but then we're two percent. Um, you know, ET, and and within that two percent, you have twenty two types. <laughs> so right. it's actually it's it's like uh, it, you really have to be uh, like an intuitive empath to like really kind of like look past the the ninety eight percent primate body and really like really scan yourself and pick and just notice like slight features and you're like oh I'm a little I look a little feline or I look a little like I kind of look maybe a little bit like a wolf or <laughs> you know what I mean like and then you might be able to. Um, like when you look at yourself, you may be able to sit, uh, see the ET DNA, the prevalent ET DNA that actually is is slightly coming through, but but it's but you know it's it's very very much diluted. So it's it's kind of more of an uh, an art than a science where do you to get actually the, like. Where do you get the ninety eight two percent statistic? I forgot to write that out. Where does that come from? Uh, yeah, sorry, that that was a recall I had um, at the LOC. They said that you're ninety eight percent primate. Uh, and they're referring to like human, like Homo sapiens, um, and, mm -hmm. and your two percent ET, and um, but within that two percent, uh, based on if you're a star seed, meaning you know you had a past right. life mm -hmm. in um, on another planet, uh, on a soul level, you'll be a little bit more um, Syrian or Andromedan or Palladian, and and because of um, the law of transference, um, that that conscious your your ET consciousness will pull from the genetic mm -hmm. just a little bit more like Syrian for example. So if you're Syrian, you might have more like wolf-like features, or if you're um, right. like um, from Lyra, you would have more cat-like features. Right. 
So yeah. that scene, if you look at though, if you just take it logically, you look at all the body types on this planet. It's quite diverse. So it seems that doesn't quite ring true to me, or maybe what they. I, there's a theory that the primates uh, it was reversal. The, the, the um, uh, my husband's the anthropologist, so I'm, I'm going to misquote it. But uh, there's a, there's a theory that the you know like the a lot of the primates came after the introduction of the um, humanoid types. But the humanoid types that we have here, you know, when the Anunnaki came through here, there were already humanoids. So there was a seeding of the humanoids. And the uh, intervention, even long before the Anunnaki came and did the latest upgrading, and then even though we have these 22 species, humans are continually being modified and upgraded. <laughs> you know, they're, they're going into the womb and they're doing this, uh, the modern gray hybrid program. And they're, um, they, uh, I have one uh, experience where he was uh, in the hospital and they came in and modified him in the hospital as an infant. They just walk right in. You know, they can do whatever they want. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to. I, yeah, I just wanted to say um, I agree with you absolutely. Uh, uh, and you said you said it, humanoid. That's the template of the universe. Like as soon as um, uh, that's what I mean. Like if you have like for example, like plug into the evolutionary formula, um, like a canine race that has biposable thumbs and walks upright, right, mm -hmm. and becomes right. tool makers, and they evolve for millions of years, they're going to become wolf-like people but like very, very human, just like we are monkeys with biposable thumbs that are, you know, very, very, what we consider human, but we're actually more primate. Um, right. So like, um, so that's what I mean. Like, like, so when you're talking about the Anunnaki being humanoid, um, whether they're um, the Syrian Anunnaki or the, or the reptilian Anunnaki, but at that point in their evolution, um, they like being a, a humanoid, they looked very human. Absolutely. Like mm -hmm. they're not actually like, you know, giant like wolves or lizards anymore. They evolved into like that humanoid template. Wow, fascinating. Uh, I had a question, now I lost it. Okay, uh, Karen, back to you for a little bit. What's going on with you? What do you want to add? Oh, no, I just, I'm just listening. I, I, I have to say that everything I've researched, you know, about Kevin, you're just right on the money with it and giving me some new information, and I appreciate it. And uh, you might be happy to know that those lunar domes that you experienced, there's an actual uh, photograph of them that uh, my partner and I work with, uh, Ken Johnson, who had a an original set of uh, Apollo I images from the Apollo era. And there was this big dispute about um, a, a photograph and a film that had a uh, captured bases on the moon and then in our current database of NASA photos online, those have been both smudged out in the early days and now they're CGI uh, erased. And every time my partner finds a new one, they erase it again. It's kind of cat and mouse game he's got going on with the powers that be that are, you know, what I try to tell people is we have an overt and a covert, you know, civilization. We have an overt and a covert science. So, we've been, so if you try to use you know, the science and the textbooks to explain all of these things we're talking about, you know, they're going to say, oh, that, you know, they're going to quote unquote debunk you. But, but the fact is, is I tell people I can absolutely physically prove that we have an over and a covert science. And the reason why is I have a small piece of Trinitite from the Trinitite, uh, uh, Trinity explosion in New Mexico. And I go there, uh, you can't hide a big giant bomb. So that became part of our covert history just because it's pretty darn huge. Uh, but if you can't see something that big, then the fact that, uh, you know, you just because you don't know about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And we now have just hundreds and hundreds of people coming out and uh, on all these programs. I'm talking about uh, William Tompkins was a, was a very important um, revelation to our research team of uh, Ken Johnson, myself, and Brett Shepard, uh, because he validated it being from TRW, the book was from TRW. And we found another guy here in New Mexico that worked for TRW who um, that was, was uh, you know, altering photographs. And also um, he uh, was a witness to an engineer who created a, you know, sort of retro engineered an electromagnetic craft that was hovering in his garage and then supposedly he died and everything disappeared so that's always interesting 
But I mean, there's an overt covert thing, and now people like you and lots of other people, and it, it's exciting to, you know, listen to another story from someone in the SST because that's where everything went. You know, the, why haven't we gone back to the moon since the pile of 17? Well, because it went everywhere else covertly, you know. Uh, why why do we not have a space shuttle program? We don't have any way ourselves in the United States of America, what uh, uh, scientist David Adair calls the America's fall from space. We do not overtly have um, a way to go get our personnel and equipment up to the ICC and back. It's like, a, it's almost like a tip off, like get a clue. There's something else. Uh, going on, but you might be happy to know there's photographs of those domes, and, and Brett was able to sort of retro, it reverse the smudging basically, and show these five domes that that uh, Ken Johnston saw. Uh, he was showing a film to scientists, and there was a, clearly a base on the moon in Chukowski Crater, and the guys were all laughing about it. What do you think of that, boys? You know, cigar chomping, patting each other on the back, and then the next day when he showed the film to the other rank and file NASA members, of course, that part was cut out. So, you know, uh, I'm just wondering, in all of this, is this concept of disclosure, okay? Um, and, and are we getting disclosure? Is, are we part of that? Is us retrieving our memories and, and working around the blank slate technology, which uh, I, my multiples at me with that, but other people saw this person, you know, uh, she came and visited me and my family was there and they were looking at her and looking at me and they're going, how did you not know that that person, this is about 15 years older. Um, so it's kind of a, kind of fun, you know, <laughs> to have that validation, but I literally don't remember it because she, she puts the whammy on me and the upshot of it was, uh, you know, I gave her an, a personal item that was like really dear to me and then has been spending the last two years trying to figure out where that thing went. And I didn't even know that I had given it to that person. So it's, it's, it's always like a patchwork process trying to remember all this. But in your opinion, like, are we on that path of disclosure just simply because I guess we're being allowed to remember these things? Uh, yeah, um, I don't know if we're being allowed to remember. I, I think, um, like the, the blank slating is 95% effective. So 95% of people that are involved don't even know they're involved. Um, it's just uh, like 5% of us, it, 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 it breaks down, it, uh, it malfunctions. Um, and um, so right now, this is, um, this, I don't think this is um, sanctioned disclosure at all in terms of the actual SSP experiencers coming forward, just um, sharing their stories. But at this point, um, it's just anecdotal evidence, you know, so it's, um, they don't really see it as a big liability. Um, if people are um, talking about, um, you know, some UFO experiences they had, some abductions they had, because it's still um, in that, um, it's still what is considered the giggle factor. Um, right. Most people, um, you know, most people think this is just like tinfoil hat stuff. So they're not really too worried about the 5% coming forward saying like, I remember being abducted by a UFO and there were military guys all around us and they took us to Mars because we don't have any physical evidence. So they're just like, okay, like, like if you guys want to talk about that, you'll have your circle and you'll have like a few experiencers and researchers and, and some open-minded people that are willing to hear you out. But I mean, that's a very small per uh, percentage compared to the, the billions of people in the world. So I, I don't think they really see it as a big threat. Uh, um, but in terms of um, like actual disclosure, disclosure, like, um, like sanctioned mainstream disclosure, um, they're going to give us a version of that eventually but um, unfortunately, it might disappoint people. They think like disclosures around the corner, but the old paradigm is going to hang on um, for as long as they can. And um, we probably won't get like another like Bill Tompkins type of disclosure for many, many years. And like, Bill, like someone like Bill Tompkins, he should have been like on the news. He should right. have been, you know, meeting with the president and then the president actually does um, a like addresses, you know, the United States and the world and says like, this is Bill Tompkins. He um, pioneered and um, uh, built, like helped uh, design the Navy's secret space program. Um, but that didn't happen. Right. And, and then Bill um, passed away. And um, so now, um, now we're kind of like, because of what you said, Karen, um, like Bill was, um, he was such an important figure because that was in the, like in the fifties and sixties when he, um, when they were um, developing 
um, the, the covert secret space program. And he was actually involved as like one of the founding fathers of it. Right. And now that he's passed away, that older generation, as they begin to pass away, uh, it's been so co- covert and covered up since that time that, um, that they, uh, they, they, they hold all the cards now and they're keeping they're the cards to, very close to, to the grave with them. I saw Bill, I was at the MUFON conference in Vegas and I ended up having a table right across from him. So I got to hang out with him for as much as I could because he was there and I was helping him and his wife. But, um, you know, I wonder about his death because he, we had to run across the casino because he was late for the panel and I grabbed his wife, uh, put her in the wheelchair and, and pushed her and, and he's, we're running across this uh, it, obstacle course and I look over and I go, Bill, are you okay? So he's like 95 years old and he's running and he's keeping right up to me <laughs> and he's not even winded, you know, I go, oh yeah, you're doing okay. <laughs> I was breathing harder than he was. So, um, yeah, I wonder, you know, was that an accident? He, he was, but he was so happy. At least he got the happiest time of his life when he was there at that conference and, and everybody was coming yeah. up around him and, and they, just loving him and, and taking pictures. And he was like the center of the world for that time. A uh, wonderful man. And uh, he recognized that I had psychic abilities. He says, you know, not everybody, not everybody has that naturally. And, and look, uh, he goes, you, you got it. He looked at me. He didn't know me from Adam, right? He, it, there's something about you. What, what, what's your story, you know? So, uh, but I just wanted to say, I, we are running out of time here, and uh, I think it will, the clock will kick. But um, I have to go back to the wolf and beans. Now, my friend, uh, T.J. Morris, who's on a, who was on a command ship outside of Mars, and they were uh, monitoring, like, a wormhole-type uh, operation, she said they they monitor it because uh, periodically these wolfen beings come through, and they are like the renegade troops, the the planet rapers, and they come in and they take everything. If they're not checked, they will come in and rape and pillage and plunder an entire planet, take all the beings, take all everything of any value, uh, water, everything, all the minerals, and leave it, uh, you know, a blank. <laughs> Uh, raped uh, planet and so there the fleet that she was in they were protecting against the this wolfen species coming through um so is that a that's not the Anunnaki it's it's another faction it's probably the original root race of the wolfen beings and I think the wolfen beings are being depicted as the Klingons in the in the revamp that's currently on Oh. oh my God, you said it. Oh my God, that's amazing. Sorry, that is so, like, you literally took the words out of my mouth. Uh-huh. Uh, at the Root Race, and then also the Klingons in Star Trek, even the old series. Uh, the Klingons are based on the ancient Syrians, the Root Race, the, the wolf people. Um, and, um, and they're very aggressive, and they're the ones that took on the Draco Orion Empire back in the day. And um, they're the only race that could act- that actually um, could... Um, basically create a standstill between the Draco Orion Empire. And um, that's why the Anunnaki were eventually created as a treaty. It was um, a hybrid, uh, like a hybrid program, almost like in ancient, uh, ancient times, um, two rival kingdoms to create an alliance will have their, their son marry the rival's daughter and create like a new um, lineage, yeah. if that makes sense, you know. They yeah. do that to this day. They're always marrying the royals off to the, you know, to, to make these alliances. So, so that goes back, and that's probably what is the story behind Enki, that he was the the um, the marriage. Yeah, Enki and Lil. Yeah, Enki and Lil and then Hersug, the three of them. Uh-huh. Uh, those would have been the um, the new royals that were created for, um, um, as a part of this treaty and this hybrid program between this, the the original Syrians, the uh, as in like uh, the Canis king uh, from the king of Canis Major Anubis mm-hmm. uh, and the Draco queen. They created um, Enki and Lil and then Har- Harsug as um, the new three royals. Right. Um, yeah. And this, then Harsug comes through me. Like, I channel her. I mean, she just, like, I sometimes I go, I am her. I can't quite describe what it is, but um, it's like a thread of her consciousness resides within me, and I sometimes go full story and full remembrance of 
what was going on, and then, then I come back into like, okay, I gotta be human today, because this is too far out there, <laughs> you know, but uh, I always say I identify with Nimma on a, on a deep level, and that's why I love humanity to the core of my being, because we are her children, you know, literally, so anyway, I have a lot of people that are coming forth, they say, I'm, I'm, uh, they like to be uh, taught, Negashida. Uh, I'm talking to a Marduk. I get a lot of Marduks. Um, hmm. a, lot, a lot of people are, are Toth. Toth. I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, but have you ever encountered that? People that say, I am that person. But I think that these advanced Anunnaki or advanced beings are able to send threads of their consciousness down simultaneously into many uh, avatars at the same quote unquote time. Um, and when I ask the question, what is that about? It's to awaken humanity, to accelerate humanity awakening, because we are reaching some kind of, uh, we're assembling it like disclosure or critical mass or the essential process, or some people go Armageddon. And I tend to lean towards, uh, you know, we're, we're transitioning into an ascended state and becoming conscious and enlightened. Uh, what do you, do you have any information on that type yeah, of thing. Um, I, I have encountered that actually, and what it is, uh, what I think it is, is um, these uh, these Anunnaki um, are very powerful beings, and they do try to telepathically communicate with people, especially channelers. And what happens is a channeler, they will start channeling Enki or Marduk, um, but eventually, what happens is then they start thinking they're Enki or Marduk, and they can't differentiate between. Uh, the being they're channeling and and their original self right so it's like an ego thing eventually they just think like oh because you know they have all this information about Enki in their head they're just like they, they they're like oh well no those are my memories from past life I was Enki in my past life and right. now I'm the reincarnation of Enki and it's like no Enki's just actually trying to communicate with you telepathically and and uh, your human brain <laughs> is kind of having an overload. Trying to figure it out. Yeah, and that's why I always tell people, don't get so full of yourself. <laughs> you're, you're here on a human avatar, and it doesn't matter who you were in a past life. You're here now, and you're here for some reason. So take the time to be who you are in the now. And uh, whenever you find yourself getting you know, haughty and arrogant, and I'm better than you, and this and that, oh, come on. Come back to Earth. <laughs> you are... Just one of us. So, okay. And the Anunnaki are still very much alive, too. That's oh, another thing. Yeah, um, yeah like, like, um, like uh, Amun Ra Marduk got kicked out of Egypt around 5000 BC, um, so only 7,000 years ago. And they have lifespans that are tens of thousands of years long. And mm -hmm. he was, um, you know, and he wasn't even really, in terms of their age, he wasn't even really that old at that point. So, like, Marduk's still alive, Enki's still alive, and Lil's still alive, Anubis is still alive. All these beings are alive. So how can you be that being if they're still alive, <laughs> you know? Well, they can, um, advanced souls can send threads of their consciousness into many beings at the same time as the illusion of, of the third dimensional plane. So it's, it's totally possible that I've had people who have met their themselves and had relationships with themselves, like in the opposite form, but it's the same Soul essence, all soul essence split into more hmm. of the one form at a time. Dr. Michael Newton Institute, read, read his, his research. They've done over 40,000 regressions to the uh, life between life states. And in that uh, state, there people were able to access that who you are as a soul essence of a higher level and why you chose to come here. And there's a lot of extraterrestrials that come here. And so the really advanced souls can be simultaneously in many places to accelerate that soul's evolution into, you know, higher level awareness and consciousness. So that I, you know, from what I get there, it, it's just so overwhelming, you know, the evidence on that. It's like, yeah, that probably is true, but yeah, you know, everybody creates a, a reality. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Multi-dimension, multi-dimensionality, um, especially once you get higher up in the densities and in, in terms of consciousness, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. I always try to come at it from like a third density perspective just to keep myself grounded because I don't want to get lost, you know, in like um, the clouds, like all this higher density type stuff. And that's why I don't, I don't channel, even though 
I am very psychic and I can remote view. One thing I don't do is I don't channel. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to criticize channelers because there is a a lot of good channel material and the, like Carl Molson, uh, he channels your higher self, which is the Mm -hmm. same as a quantum healing hypnosis session, except he does the work for you, which is helpful for people who can't be um, induced and uh, um, have gone for hypnosis and it didn't work like Mm -hmm. you could always reach out to carl and he can channel your higher self and it's like what you talked about like it's your future self it's it's another version of you in the future that can travel back in time and and give you information um which which actually shortens your evolution a little bit which is cool (laughs) right well um you know we've done a lot of work with thousands of clients and like holotropic breath work and um some people have uh, done the theogenic journeying and facilitated their sh- like a shaman. So there's all kinds of ways of accessing the information, but you always protect yourself. If somebody wants to come through, you don't allow them to take over. Usually you can feel them, um, you know, like uh, uh, touching your shoulder or something like that. And it's like, okay, uh, there's some information wanting to come through. I, ne- I was channeled me. <laughs> I never go anywhere. I would never like check out and let somebody else take over my body. I'm always there and I never do anything unless it's very, very, very safe. And um, then take everything with a grain of salt. Usually what happens when I get information is that somebody else validates it later. I go, Oh shit, that's real. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but I'm always open. I ever, I don't judge people's stories. You know, um, one of my favorite people is Bashar, right? But, and then you have all these people, Rafa, everybody, they got the information. But what we've noticed, um, if you look at it all and you don't judge it, there is a correlation with a lot of the information. But that's all we can do is recognize the correlation. But information, it comes through, you know, how many billions of people have been alive? And if you were to interview all the billions of people that have ever, you know, come into human form and spent a lifetime here and, you know, ask them to tell their story, you're going to have correlations. You're going to have things that are completely unique and different, even on the same incident. Like you might have, you know, a uh, thousand people that went through Auschwitz, right? And you might have a thousand variations on what was Auschwitz like, and, you know. So everything that you look at has um, similarities and differences. So that's why I don't judge other people's stories. But somehow that's valuable in, the, in the terms of the Akashic Records. Like as as uh, that's probably why we're doing lifetimes is to create these stories, which are you know recorded and looked at by other beings. It, it helps to diversify creation and diversify existence by having all these stories, especially this, the human story, where we are connected to our emotions in such a deep, core, critical way, and uh, we're here in the deepest uh, density, our dimensionally conventional physicality okay we got like five four minutes let's begin to wrap up um sure karen what would you like to say well i just want to say uh thank you to kevin for coming on i really really enjoyed it i hope janet when you have him back on you give give me a call because i want to hear more it's been really great and uh are you kevin have you like uh written a book or you just kind of coming out of the SSP closet or where's your process as far as communicating all of this and what kind of feedback have you gotten from other people? Uh, uh, Thanks. uh, Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I'll definitely uh, come back and um, I can go into more detail about my recalls. And then to answer your question, Karen, um, uh, I'm not even on Facebook. I'm just on Skype and email. And um, basically, uh, the feedback I've got has been mostly positive. And what uh, I didn't expect is um, when I did that first interview with Denny Hunt on um, why, uh, why is this true YouTube channel um, back in June, um, I thought I was just going to do um, one interview just to get my timeline out there. And that would become a, like a part of like the historical archive and disclosure. I would just be like one other, one more experiencer just going over my basic timeline. What I didn't expect was for other SSP experiencers who recognize me from the program, like Anthony Zender, uh, Elena, um, uh, a lady by the name of KJ Scoops. Um, we had a shared recall together and um, a couple other people that have since come forward. And um, so they reached out to me and they're like, I remember you. And then they would um, share a recall with me and, and, um, and uh, 
it would be the same, like we'd have the same dreams and it was uh, really freaky. And uh, like, what, what are the odds that like two people would have the same dream, right? And uh, I know we got to wrap up. I'll probably get into this more next time, but um, yes, just sure. recently, uh, just like recently in December, um, Anthony Zender and I, um, we messaged each other at the same time, the same day. And he's like, I just had this dream that I was on the TR3 and we were remote viewing a submarine. And I'm like, oh my God, man, me too. We had the exact same dream. So um, that's why like one interview led to another. And I think I've done like 10 already. Um, but I, I just, I thought I'd just do the one. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> no, you can't quit. You've got, and, and you, you're very articulate. And we, I, I definitely, I'll, I'll write to you, I'll send you some dates to keep you back on. And I'd like to do some programs. Uh, you can give me recommendations. Like you might want to be on with Anthony. Um, we could do some panels. I will, uh, you know, we could do some Skype. I'm going to figure out how to get it uploaded and all that stuff. Um, because I'm here to, to, you know, awaken you and me to this. Oh, I want to say, I think when you start recalling something, it triggers other people. So, yeah, we might have that small percentage that will be able to overcome the mind wipe, but the telling of the story triggers other people, and they overcome their mind wipes. And that's probably why they want to maintain control over this so that um, – you know, not too many people wake up and became conscious. But it, on some level, I think they're allowing us to wake up. So there is something going on there. Okay, final words to you, Kevin, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, well, I just want to thank you again for having me on. And, um, yeah, we can definitely do uh, some panels. Um, there's uh, some other experiencers that I, I've done roundtables with um, that I can recommend. Uh, and uh, yeah, it'd be great to to be on with Anthony. And um, I know uh, Elena and I have done quite a few interviews together, so I know she's definitely someone that would be interested in the round table as well. So we'll, uh, we'll definitely do uh, a follow up at some point. So Excellent. thank you. And we're going to be putting on a conference in probably September 14th weekend. I'm working on finalizing the uh, agreement with the venue. Uh, so you're in. Uh, are you in the UK or are you in Canada? I got confused there. Uh, Canada, Ontario. Oh, Ontario. Um, yeah. Yeah, London, London, Ontario. Not London, uh, England. <laughs> London, Ontario. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were talking about Ontario or uh, Canadian London, and then you said something about the UKs have the same uh, uh, vehicle, and I went, what? <laughs> okay, so I confused myself. I do that sometimes. Well, um, yeah, I will talk to you later, and thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And Karen, thank you for coming in. And yes, I'll let you know when we have Kevin on and other people like um, Anthony Zender. I think I have him booked for somewhere. And I definitely have talked to um, Tony Rodriguez, um, Penny Bradley, a um, bunch of others. So uh, Russ Kellett, we have to have you on with Russ Kellett. He's in the UK. And he feels kind of isolated. He could really use some support. So anyway, we'll figure this all out. But thank you once again, and uh, much love and blessings and aloha, and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Have a good night. Okay, bye-bye. Want entertainment designed just for you? Then check out customizable streaming TV from Xfinity. It makes your life simple, easy, awesome. Xfinity gives you customizable streaming TV options. Enjoy the most free shows anywhere on any device and even access your streaming apps right on your TV with X1. Go to Xfinity.com, call 1-800-XFINITY, or visit a store today to learn more. Restrictions apply.